squat scorn this video is sponsored by Squarespace the number one place to give the internet even more internet by making your own website scorn do you know what the best thing about the Wallabies' recent revival and out of nowhere winning streak is? No longer having to feel sorry for Michael Hooper. Since he made his debut in 2012, the only flanker who hasn't travelled by skateboard because his sheer engine makes cars too jealous to let him drive them has been the absolute heartbeat of every Wallabies team. And for the last five years, Hooper has been the other organs as well. In an Australia side kind of treading water, a team fearing the worst as results started to slide, reliant on their magnificent world-class captain to pull them out of trouble. And so, I can't begin to describe just how weird it is that we're about to talk about Australian rugby for, what, about 20 minutes? And from here on, I'm barely, I'm going to only really mention Michael Hooper in passing. And here's the thing, Australia's team most of us neutrals want to talk about right now. This has been a year where title after title has been won by an underdog, where top intensity tests are 10 plenty. And yeah, I think most of us are sad just waiting for our chance to talk about the Wallabies, rather than prattling through the discourse again to decide how we feel about Razzie Erasmus, Sam Simmons, or whether Warren Gatland was wrong to have salt and vinegar crisps for lunch. Two years ago, Australian rugby was staring into the void, and worse yet, it had Michael Checker shouting in its ear. Now, they're shaping up nicely to be dark horses for 2023, so how have Australia climbed back to near the top, you know, third from the top, and how worried should England, Scotland and Wales be ahead of their November matchups? For the past five years, Australia have been one of the hardest test teams to quantify, taking France's place in the cliché as pundits fight the words, you never know which Australian team's going to turn up from falling from their mouths. Most of this came under the guidance of Michael Checker, a coach who tells us what would happen if you crossed a millionaire with a bop it. Shouty, screamy and stubborn, Checker shrieked Australia into shape to push New Zealand for the 2015 World Cup before seeing their form drop off a cliff. It's a universal trend in every team Checker coaches, initial brilliance, usually resulting in smiles and potentially silverware, until it all becomes one note. Oppositions work out his stubborn tactics and players tire of being shouted at by a man who looks like Louis Spence got cast in the Marvel movie. It's a trend we're seeing with Argentina at the moment. Atmosphere begins to sour, results go south, and everyone ends up miserable. Checker spoke with great pride at the 2019 World Cup of how he didn't analyse any of his opponents and didn't work on a tactical kicking game because he wanted them playing running rugby for the sake of his own ego. And, well, you know, they did play that running game without a tactical kicking game, and it ended up looking an awful lot like this. Yeah. And that is a quarterfinal exit and Checker being fired before the end of the tournament. And in his place came one Mr. Dave Rennie, who I discovered whilst researching this video, played one game on the wing for the Cook Islands. Rennie had previously seen great success with the Chiefs, winning Super Rugby twice, and had also coached Glasgow. Rennie's approach to coaching is almost entirely different to Checkers. For one, he comes across as a professional, but has put real focus on reconnecting the Wallaby team with the joy of the game, sending players out to training sessions with kids and local clubs, or Hooper into the opposition changing rooms after every game to present gifts. These things might seem like kind of tokenistic bullshit, but they're all attempts to remind the side why they got into rugby in the first place and find the fun in the game after the few years they've had. But crucially, this fun isn't tokenistic, it's a core part of how they play the game. The Wallabies are a team who we all want to watch because they seem to love how they play. So how do they play? This is a style of play manufactured. Former England attack coach Scott Wisemantle, who realised in late 2019 there was a job opening that allowed him to not spend all day with Eddie Jones without trading him for Michael Checker. It's very fast, expansive rugby. Australia were the second team to Japan to adopt the increasingly standard 1-3-2-2 system, but their execution has been extremely different. The first few games under Rennie and Wisemantle gave us our cleanest look at the system in its purest form. Australia are a bit like if you left that Japan side in the oven too long. They're a melted, stretchier version of the same game plan with a few burnt bits. Whereas Japan play many phases around the previous ruck to up the tempo, Australia like to spread it wide and double up, forwards folding and hitting lines late after quick ball, akin to England in 2019. And then the burnt bits are used to deliver punch when things start to lose their flavour. However, any team who adopts and sticks to a strict game plan at the top level, as Checker knows, tends to be found out sooner or later. This has not yet happened to Australia, and I'm kind of doubting it will anytime soon, because Rennie is doing exactly what Checker wouldn't. He's doing analysis. 
every fixture, Australia tweak and twist their game plan to the opposition's strengths and weaknesses. The idea is always the same. The Wallabies want quick ball, so they target points in the defence that allow them to catch the opposition off guard the following phase to attack the next time round. How they go about this is what changes with the fixture. The All Blacks, for instance, their defence might not be fearsome, but it's incredibly consistent because it spreads itself incredibly thin. It's about covering every blade of grass equally instead of trying to smash you backwards a la Sean Edwards or Jacques Nineveh. Covering that amount of ground is only possible through prioritisation, so the All Blacks tend to only commit one man at a time to break down, leaving it light. One guard on either side, nobody else near. So, Australia targeted it for three straight games. Tate McDermott is exceptional at this. Here, Ioane disrupts the line-out ball, so Barrett rushes up to take advantage, but his teammates aren't on the same page, and it creates a kind of small dog leg here for Lolaseo. The Kiwi defence, setting up for the first time, is focused on folding, hairing it from the line-out position, and completely ignores McDermott as he sneaks right through. Grevy considers the pick-and-go, but takes out his man and offloads here to Philip, who smashes up into the same space around the ruck. New Zealand defence, still completely unaligned, and that means quick ball to Falau Fayanga, who can then crash over the try line scoring he scores a try the phase before the score is something australia do all the time and no other test team seems to be cottoning onto yet modern defenses are so good that even obvious overlaps are often essentially at best 50 50 scoring opportunities as the defense drifts out towards the wing so the wallabies like to play a phase first off line breaks to disable it here the all black defense is preparing to cover the men over but tamua drops a short ball and they're forced to make a tackle and get back on side then this disrupts the defense tamua then sprints in himself and passes out before anyone even commits and corabetti can score the all black defense having had to backtrack before they can drift out and make the tackles again and here, again, at the weekend against Japan, the stand-up try came from Australia playing two successive phases in less than two seconds, passing out before a second man has entered the ruck. This was Rob the Otter's first try for the Wallabies, and it was a somewhat bittersweet occasion for him. See, ever since the Otter was a young, massive boy somewhere in Australia, he dreamt of having his own website where he could log his every international try. But then he tried learning HTML, and he started trying to do flashy coding, and bit by bit he gave up on his dream, convinced making a website wasn't for him. But this was only because Rob the Otter had never heard of Squarespace. Squarespace makes building a website so easy, even someone with toilet tube shaped fingers like Liotta can manage it. They can make a beautiful website using their super easy drag and drop tools. And the best bit is, it's there, available, even for those of us who aren't important enough to have scored test tries. In fact, it's even better for anyone watching this video right now, like, for example, you, because all of us can get a sneaky percentage off our own website by using the offer code Squid Rugby or by clicking the link in the description. However, the excellence of their analysis wasn't stopped with some fringe sniping and goal line stomping. Faced with free tests, Australia built moves to exploit New Zealand watching for McDermott's snipes. Laulala is settling into the side of the ruck when he notices McDermott pick up and he shits himself, chasing the nine. At the same time, Ioani and Vitalik are preparing themselves for this three-man pod. When Valentini breaks away from his mates and hits the space Laulala has abandoned to cover McDermott. Australia play more phases close to the ruck, just keeping the pace up. McDermott picks and goes, here prompting Taylor out of line and letting Swinson find the hole. However, the next phase, New Zealand's line speed is much more organised, so he carries in himself. The ground is always going to be minimal, but it prevents New Zealand shooting up just in case. An effect felt immediately as they give it to Lolaseo and Corabetti. So much time to play the ball, the winger able to spin and dash his way right up the line. Australia play fast. This close to conceding, New Zealand take the risk of the line speed, but it opens up a hole for McDermott. Once again, he's really, really good at this. New Zealand start to condense around the ruck, so aware of the threat of McDermott. Their entire defence changes to try and manage the scrum off. Look now how narrow winger Reese is. And a pinpoint kick by Lolaseo gives Kellaway the time and space he needs to step around McKenzie, who's had to rush across if you look here, and hence he's somewhat off balance, meaning he's easily beaten by Kellaway. It continually caught New Zealand off guard. From simple stuff such as more snipes by McDermott and the gloriously mustachioed little piss boy, Nick White, here resulting in a try for Tom Banks. However, there was also some lovely innovations such as forward pods of backs allowing Lolaseo to pick a line off Cora and Betty and break the line. This saw Australia score. 10 tries past the All Blacks, more than all the other teams they've played this year put together. But this would never work against the Springboks. The South African defence is incredibly different to the All Blacks. The box are super aggressive around the breakdown, looking to slow the ball and buy themselves as much time to be aggressive the following phase. They want you to condense it. They want you to attack around the ruck. It's a defence with endless fail-safes. It's a defence really built to be fault-proof. 
So those failsafes were what Australia targeted. It's a frankly kind of ingenious thing to do. South Africa have the best defence in the world because they know all their own weaknesses. They found every hole in the house and boarded it up. Most sides, the All Blacks and Lions included, naturally start to look for other entrances. They look for other ways into the house. Australia instead decided to punch those boards over the broken windows over and over again until they shattered and they broke their way in. So, the bog defence works a bit like this. The furthest out players are looking to shoot inwards when they spot a chance to kill the attack, and then these guys inside them are drifting across behind in case anything goes wrong. The attack is shut down from outside the ball carrier's eye line, and yet it's impossible to get outside them. However, there's a key word in those couple of sentences that nobody but Rennie and his team seems to have picked up on when targeting the spring box. It's the word behind. Drifting players, the failsafe option, that's this guy here, can't shoot up at the same speed as Am or the winger. That's just physics. If they did, they'd be skidding all over the place and it'd be a mess. This then creates a small hole right here in the defence. So, why has nobody ever scored through this gap and only one team ever really tried to do it? Three reasons, right? One, the hole only exists when Am and Cozy, Mapimpi or Colby have read your attack and know exactly how they're going to shut it down. So, mm, you know, you're doing that foot there. It only opens up when your attack is already doomed. Two, it's time tiny and temporary is usually only there for maybe a second, second and a half at tops. Free Damian Diolande. The guy tasked with closing it is one of the best defensive centres in the world and he can usually get hold of you in the second and a half, no problem. As such, the hole is not a problem. The hole is not exploitable. The hole is basically insignificant. Unless you adapt your entire shape, structure and tactics to attack it. Free problems in their way, right? The Wallabies knew there was truly no way round Diolande, but chips and grubbers like this help keep him on his toes, knowing he could be able to turn and regather at any point, slowing his line speed. However, dealing with his outside men was the greater challenge and this required more radical change. In those two tests against South Africa, the Wallabies attacked from deeper positions than in any of the other games under Rennie and Wisemantle. The backs stood further away, yet Cooper still stood reasonably flat. These backs are essentially bait. They're here to draw the box up and out. Here, Callaway's depth makes it very easy for Nkosi to read, and he makes the hit. But that's just what the Wallabies wanted him to do, to get him out the game. The next phase they reload left, and if not for Nkosi's incredible work rate to get back here and put pressure on Cooper, Corrin Betty can hit a line off him and go under the posts. The depth has another boon too. The greater distance gives Am and friends more time and incentive to make the read, knowing there could be huge gains, and it elongates this hole slightly, adding maybe an extra, say, fifth quarter of a second onto the time available. The Wallabies frequently use this gap to not strike, but to launch. It was an opportunity to generate quick ball and forward momentum, frequently firing Karevi straight in, knowing it's his cleanest shot at the game line. Here is Taniela Tupo hitting it, and he bumps out the way to make a really great carry. However, the Springboks then slow the ball down enough to reset and readjust, considering the penalty, but the Wallabies are ready. Pollard fills in Am's channel, but the Wallabies attack it exactly the same. He takes the bait, and Kellaway flicks it inside to Corin Betty into that gap. Vermeulen closes the hole pretty quickly, but it's just long enough for Marika to free an arm and offload to Ikitao. It's an absolutely perfect example of how to exploit this tiny chink in the Springbok defence, and I'd wager Wales, Scotland, England, all taking an awful lot of notes right here. Ikitao's overtry from this game comes from a similar manipulation of their system. Slipper here targets the hole between the two centres, and Alatoa grabs Am, presumably angry there's now a rugby player where a greater proportion of the letters in their surname are A than him, and it takes both centres out the game. Pollard is left desperately trying to do free men's job, and is unsure where to stand. This leaves Nkosi with a decision. Stick to his role, or pretend he's Damien Diolande and help Pollard out. He chooses to stick to his own, stepping out instead of helping Pollard, and it leaves Ikatao hitting Pollard's unprepared shoulder and crashing over to score the try. But better yet, best oh, best one they did with this try by Andrew Calloway, a kind of beautiful bit of design help design to exploit the Bok defence. So, Australia form a mall, something no Springbok can ever resist, but they pop it straight round the back to Fayanga, having drawn in most of the forwards. The box have left just two front rows to cover, but Australia send three runners into their face. Mal Herbert goes for Callaway, which means Umbanambi has to jam in on his opposite number, leaving space for Karevi to get up a full head of speed and nobody to compete for the ball after the tackle, letting Oz play as quickly as they'd like. Hooper clears out Diolande and carries on <laughs> carrying him away, well away from the ruck, meaning he has no time to line up in defence before Philip has the ball and is in his face. The dummy mall and dummy runners have meant the entire bot pack is still on this side here and they're hurrying to fall into position, meaning nobody competes for the ball again, granting Australia it quick so fast. The Wallabies go wider, true to the system, and Kosi steps in off his wing again. This leaves this side undefended, so Vermeulen enters the ruck to try and slow it down. 
because he knows he has to buy them some time. Diolande sprints around to cover using the second he buys. Now, I've talked previously in the past about how the Springbok defence is primarily reliant on Dwayne Vermeulen to tell them what to do. He organises the thing on the fly, and if possible, South Africa want to avoid him getting involved in contact so he can focus on using his brain, not brawn, or he's hanging around the back of the ruck, giving him the best vantage point to tell who and what is needed and tell people what to do. Look at this from the second test, right? McDermott spots a chance to target both him and Vincent Cock, the tight head who would normally fill in if Vermeulen is unavailable. With both of them on the floor, nobody is there to prevent Faf de Klerk and Malcolm Marks folding around to the open side, meaning the other side is short, and a simple mispass means Australia can put Taniel Tupo down the wing to draw and give beautifully to put Corin Betty away for the decisive try. And likewise, Vermeulen entering the ruck here prevents Australia with a green and golden opportunity. They pin him and hold him after the ball is gone. So, after the next phase is played, the two most important men in the Springbok defence, Vermeulen, who organises the thing, and Dialande, who leads the line speed, are over here, good as out the game. This leaves Lukanyu Am, one of the best defensive players on the planet, in such a weird situation. Ezebeth's job here is to fly out a line and pressure Cooper. Fast's job is to fly out a line here and pressure Karevi. And this leaves Am as the entire defensive line? He goes at a different pace, disconnects, because there's no one to connect with, and Karevi can make the simplest step to break the line. It's in a brilliant finish by Kellaway, who holds his whip and times his step. It's superb. It's a really great finish. He's become such a great international winger. The attack is dangerous on its own, but it's added to by the analysis. It's deadly. Against Argentina and Japan, the Wallabies didn't commit so much time and study to the system, relying more on their pure pace and skill, and I wonder if that's what they're going to bring to the UK in November. Three opponents in three weeks, rather than consecutive games against one team, presents less opportunity for detailed analysis and strategy, and I'd be fascinated to see if they have stuff in the bag to target Wales, England and Scotland specifically, or they'll rely on their attack alone. Because that attack isn't perfect yet, England under Wisemantle played their best rugby with a midfield combo of Ford, Farrell and Tuolangi, two distributors and a big smash lad with Daly working as an alternate playmaker from fullback. It took a lot of trial and error to get there and I don't think Australia have quite nailed the balance of their full back line yet. Don't get me wrong, the midfield combo of Simon Grevy, Lenny Kittow and Quaid, oh my god I'm talking about Quaid Cooper in 2021, in a, in a wallaby shirt, I can't quite believe it, Quaid Cooper has been incredibly effective against both the box and Argentina, but I think it's just the closest they've come, not the finished item. Simon Grevy they spent the last two years in Japan being paid a big chunky wage to be a big chunky wage, but has evidently also used it as an opportunity to work on his game. His passing and distribution are night and day from where they were in 2019, but he still isn't a playmaker by nature, at least not yet. If we look at the follow-up to Lolliseo's break I highlighted earlier, with their 10 out of the game, Hooper steps in and spots they have numbers wide, but nobody is calling this attack, nobody's running this phase. It's just players spinning it out, passing it out, and it leaves Matt Phillip blind flowing a pass to... David Havili, who runs in from 80 metres. If Matt Tamua was at 12, if James O'Connor was at fullback, if even Hunter Baisami was at 13, Australia have someone who can act as a playmaker to slot in and run this phase, meaning Philip isn't throwing the pass blind. The power and surprising sumptuous subtlety of Karevi and Ikatao generated the pace the Wallabies want to play with, but best using that pace likely requires an alternate playmaker for when Cooper, O'Connor or Lollase, whoever's at 10, is out the game. It's not a bad problem for Dave Rennie to have though, because it's within his own power to solve. Toying with backline combos will likely form a big part of the next year as he progresses through his very clear and intelligent four-year plan building towards 2023. Year one looks a bit like this. Rennie's first test match in charge as Wallaby King saw him select five uncapped players and make 13 chains to the team who started Checker's last game in charge. He went on to hand out 16 debuts in his first 16 games in charge, essentially creating a brand new squad. If something was rotten at the heart of Checker's camp, rather than reboot it, he created a brand new atmosphere filled with new boys, excited to play for the country and players Checker had long since discarded, equally buzzing to be back. Back. Suddenly, the scenes coming out of the camp went from this to this. Dancing with one voice, I am, you are, we are Australian. I am, you are, we are Australian. International rugby to this group is more about passion, pride, and fulfilling a childhood dream than professional obligation. Over the course of the year, these young players got used to Test Rugby. It's somehow less than a year since Tate McDermott made his international debut, but he feels like an established Test Match player. Noel Oliseo is an incredibly green young 10, but a proven match winner 
in multiple test matches late on. Hunter Baisami, Harry Wilson, Angus Bell, Lena Kittel, Darcy Swain have all bedded into test match rugby in just a handful of caps. Rennie has taken a year to get the novelty and nerves of playing international rugby out of their system without stripping away the excitement or rotated in and out the team to prevent them ever getting burnt out or overwhelmed. Year two changed focus. These young players now established, the culture needs to stay the same, but their mentality shift. The Wallabies were on the receiving end of a few big scorers during that first year, and it's time to transition into a kind of winning mindset. Not that they weren't trying to win in year one, but as these young players grow in experience, an extra discipline has to be introduced, led by recall players from around the world. Quaid Cooper's seemingly been indoctrinated into a cult run by Ted Lasso since we last saw him in gold, but the calm that's come with it has been infectious. At international level, knowing how to win is a skill, and this Wallaby side are currently picking that up and getting better and better at it every time they do it. And we're already seeing the start of plans for year three in the inspired and bold decision to leave two of their most promising players, Wilson and Lolaseo, in Australia for this tour. Content they can perform at test level, but wanting physical changes to their body and game. Rennie says Lolaseo has the mentality and talent for international rugby, he's sure of that, but they want him to work on his muscle mass for defence and kicking range in order to become the 10 they need for 2023. And it's easier to do that on the training pitch back home than whilst preparing for a test match in Cardiff or Edinburgh or wherever. The next phase is about getting those young players from comfortable at test level to the players he needs them to be for whatever he wants to do in the World Cup. It's about integrating the two approaches, starting to settle the side so the final year, the final few months before he goes into the World Cup, can just be about the small tweaks and changes. The personnel sorted by the end of year three, meaning the final stages can be purely about the rugby. Because with each passing week, Rennie looks closer and closer to maybe pulling this off. At the very least, Australia are now a properly competitive side who everyone loves to watch. At most, they're proper contenders for 2023, growing all the time. This autumn tour will teach us a lot about where they're at in that quest as they face the home nations for the first time. Because right now, I wouldn't write off the idea that we might have to talk about Mike Hooper quite a bit again as he leads his nation out in a few years' time, finally free of any and all pity for another World Cup final in 2023. You join me at the official Squid Rugby office, which now exists. This is the first video I've made in full here. Um, I've got st stuff. I've got all the fixtures of the autumn on the wall because that kicks off this weekend. There are autumn fixtures this weekend. I'm going to be out where's New Zealand. If anyone's there, say hello. Um, otherwise, there's loads more coming on the channel. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed that. That was quite a deep dive on Australia. I've been pouring over them for weeks and there's more to come out on them over the next few weeks as they play more games. So I'm going to try to cover as many of the autumn games as possible. Some of them might not be possible. Um, I apologise if I can't get to your team's game, but there's a lot of work to be doing. Uh, I'm going to be spending a lot of time in here, probably consuming those very slowly. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching that. Thank you for watching that on Patreon, and I'll see you very soon.